Abraham Lincoln is nothing less than a legendary historical figure. His passage of the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment put an end to a nearly century-long struggle against slavery in the United States. However, Lincoln was a complex man working in extremely complicated times, and therefore his views on slavery and race don't always seem so clear-cut. In Team of Rivals, we're told that Lincoln believed that slavery was an institution founded on injustice and bad policy. Now, Lincoln was always always anti-slavery, but he wasn't always necessarily an abolitionist, which is a distinction I'll go into in a moment. As well as this, this is a time when it's not considered inconsistent to think that black people are humans, but to also believe that they're not equal to white people. As Guelzo writes in his essay, even the most progressive thinkers on slavery were terrified that they would be attributed to black and white equality. Throughout the Civil War, Lincoln's avowed purpose was to save the Union and not to end slavery, however he still took baby steps to do this throughout the conflict. And I would put to you then, instead of seeing this as an unwillingness to end slavery, or even as Lincoln getting more progressive as the war went on, we should instead view these actions in the context of his time. And therefore, I think that this is the story of how one man navigated the toxic political atmosphere he was living in, and ended the most inhumane practice in human history. So before I begin, this is Why Vogue Joe, it's a channel where I talk a bit too much about film, politics and history. If that's your cup of tea, which I assume it is because you're here, then why not click subscribe and ring the bell so you know the next time I make a video. Right, on to Abe Lincoln. What do I mean when I say he wasn't an abolitionist? Well, an abolitionist was someone who believed that slavery should be ended instantly, whereas Lincoln was someone who thought it should be phased out gradually. When Lincoln started politics, the country was already split into slave states and free states by the Missouri Compromise, and Lincoln believed that if slavery was contained in the South, then it would eventually die out on its own. Another reason that Lincoln thought the process should be gradual is that he didn't believe that freed slaves would make their homes in America, and instead they would find them in colonies in Africa and South America. He's quoted in Team of Rivals as saying that when you are freed, you are yet far off the advantages that the other race enjoy, and therefore it's better for us to be separated. Now, obviously, this didn't happen, and it is something that he changed his mind on through the influence of people like Frederick Douglass. However, this is what he believed in the 1830s and 40s. His idea of containment was also challenged because in the 1840s, America went to war with Mexico and took a lot of their land. And the debate over what could be done with the land as regards slavery would shatter the fragile consensus that Congress had on the issue in the 1820s. In 1846, for example, there was an idea floated called the Wilmot Proviso, which would ban all slavery in the newly acquired territories. An abolitionist newspaper justified this at the time by saying if the West said no to annexing more slave territory into the Union, then the dark tide of slavery would be stayed forever. And Abraham Lincoln was also supportive of this motion, saying essentially they should never knowingly lend themselves to extending the life of slavery and stopping it from dying a natural death. However, as you can imagine, slaveholders were less infused. Senator John Calhoun would call the bill unconstitutional because it would stop Southerners from moving into commonly held American territory with their so-called property. He also worried that it would skew the balance between the northern free states and the southern slave states. Now the bill did pass in the House by 84 to 64 with only three uh, votes in favour coming from slave states, however it would never reach the Senate because the session in the House expired and the bill went right along with it. But this wasn't an issue which could just be left alone and therefore Henry Clay, who was one of the authors of the Missouri Compromise, would come up with a series of ideas which would become known as the Compromise of 1850. Now there are two really important ideas behind this. The first one is that they were going to admit free states instantly into the Union, California, Utah and New Mexico. Now California was going to hold a ballot over whether or not to allow slavery within its borders with the expectation that they'd probably vote against it, and New Mexico and Utah would essentially just be admitted as slave states. The other thing the Compromise of 1850 was going to do was strengthen the Fugitive Slave Act. Now this was a poorly enforced law which tried to stop slaves from escaping 
into free states, but under this new uh, vamped up version, they would allow federal marshals to hunt down escaped slaves, they would make it a crime to help the escaped slaves, and they would get rid of all sorts of trials um, that were held beforehand. According to Team of Rivals, Clay recognised that he was asking more from the North than he was from the South, however he pleaded to the North to save the Union. The North, he said, was opposed to slavery merely based on ideology and sentiment, whereas Southerners had a lot more practical concerns like uh, property rights and way of life and things like that. Now this position was mocked by Frances Seward, the wife of Lincoln's future Secretary of State, who said if Henry Clay lives to 70 years old and he still thinks that slavery is only opposed for those reasons and he knows a lot less about human nature than I suppose. This compromise was still not enough for the slave states and in 1854 Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Now this essentially abolished the Missouri Compromise by allowing states to decide for themselves whether or not they allowed slavery by popular sovereignty. People like Lincoln spoke out against this and he said that it was nothing more than a legal term for the perpetuation and expansion of slavery and therefore it was a possible death knell of the Union. As slaveholders got more and more radical, anti-slavery and abolitionist forces would push back against them and this would provide fertile ground for the creation of the unabashedly anti-slavery Republican Party. When they won in 1860 with Abraham Lincoln on their presidential ticket, the majority of slave states would secede from the Union and the Civil War would be just around the corner. If you want to understand the actions of Lincoln then it's important not to conflate the Union with the Republican Party because while every state in the Confederacy was pro-slavery it doesn't necessarily follow that all of the states in the Union were free soil. In fact there were four states known as border states which were incredibly important to Lincoln and therefore he had to be quite tepid around the question of slavery because he knew that the destiny of Kentucky and the other ones would be decided based on the Union's position. In Missouri for example there were some some Confederate sympathisers and the state militia tried to seize control of the state. So the Union sent in troops to suppress the rebellion and when they won, the general in charge, Fremont, tried to free all of the state's slaves. Now, Lincoln relieved him of command pretty soon after that, saying he'd essentially overstepped his station because only the president can make decisions like that regarding slavery, but I think when we think about the importance of the border states to the Civil War and the Union movement, we may, you know, think that might have some bearing on the decision. Throughout the war, Lincoln claimed that his only aim was to save the Union, and he's quoted as saying, if I can save the Union by freeing all of the slaves, then I'll do that. If I can do it by freeing some of the slaves and leaving the rest alone, then I'll do that as well. However, if we look at Lincoln's actions throughout the war, he still takes baby steps to end the practice while justifying it as a necessary military measure. Take, for example, the Confiscation Acts, which turned the idea that slaves were private property on its head. In 1860, they said that because the Confederates considered slaves to be property and they were using this property to further rebellion against the United States that they were essentially military contraband and could be taken. And the 1862 law is even more explicitly anti-slavery saying that not only will rebels be either executed, fined or imprisoned for their actions against the Union but all of their slaves, if any, shall be freed. In 1863 Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation for specifically military reasons and he said that all slaves in Confederate territory were to be freed and that they could join the Union military if they wanted to. Now I don't know whether Lincoln did this just for military purposes but Frederick Douglass for his part thought that this was an excellent thing because black people fighting gave them a stake in their country and therefore took them one step closer to equality with white people. And Lincoln also seemed to care a bit more about the black soldiers than like you know other members of his cabinet saying that anyone who either executed or re-enslaved black soldiers would themselves be executed or put to hard labour. I think that we should also note that the proclamation was issued after the Battle of Antietam, a huge Union victory. So the Union was already doing pretty well militarily and while more soldiers always helps, Lincoln must have known that his action would really annoy the border states. As well as this, Lincoln went against his own cabinet to issue this. Apparently the cabinet voted 7-1 to one against him and Lincoln said, well, 7 against, 1 for, the eyes have it. Lincoln waited until the Union was in a good position militarily and then he issued the Emancipation. As the war was drawing to a close, Lincoln secured the freedom of slaves with the 13th Amendment. Now his justification for this was unabashedly anti-slavery. He's quoted in Team of Rivals as saying that the end of slavery by constitutional provision settles the fate for all coming time, not only for the millions in bondage at the moment, but for the unborn 
millions to come. And I view this as his final push towards doing what he always wanted to do. Now there is some disagreement about this. Frederick Douglass, for example, said the president grows as the nation grows, and a lot of scholars would agree with Mr. Douglass. However, I don't, and I'm just gonna lay out to you why I don't. For sure, Lincoln's public views changed, but I'm not convinced that his private ones ever did. In Team of Rivals, he's quoted as saying, if slavery isn't wrong, then nothing is wrong, and that he couldn't remember a time when he didn't think and feel so. As well as this, Howard writes that even though Lincoln always had the same moral tendencies as the most radical Republicans in his party, he was also far more astute than them and had far better political ability and so he was actually able to get it done. There is one aspect where Lincoln radically changed his opinion and that is on colonisation. Now, a team of rivals says that this is because his remarkable empathy completely failed him in this aspect because he didn't really have any contact with the black community and therefore he was completely unaware that this was offensive to them because of their deep attachment to their country. Now obviously this changed because of his friendships with uh, Frederick Douglass and black soldiers and he began to understand them a little bit better and what would actually be best for them. However, this lapse in understanding doesn't mean that he was ever pro-slavery. For Lincoln, ending slavery was a matter of strategic patience and waiting until the right moment. He himself likened the process to picking a pear off of a tree, right? If you do it too soon, then you're gonna destroy the pear and you're probably gonna destroy the tree as well. But if you wait until the right moment, then a pear could drop off the tree right into your lap. Lincoln also believed that with public opinion, you could do basically anything, but without it, nothing would succeed. And he had to do his actions based on whether public opinion would sustain them or not. He even worried about this towards the end of the war when he said that if the rebels agreed to rejoin the United States on the condition that they could keep their slaves and he would be absolutely powerless to continue fighting the war for the sole purpose of abolition. But luckily for him, the Confederates did agree to give up their slaves and the war ended like that. With all important figures, it's kind of easy to see them as a cardboard cutout, and I don't think that Lincoln is any exception because his story seems very, like, you know, open and closed. He came to be president in the middle of a crisis, and he died as that crisis wrapped up without ever actually having the chance to explain his actions, and therefore we can't ever know, and I know that my opinion that I've given to you today is just one of a million possible ones. However, I think that when we look at Lincoln and we take him even with all of his flaws, then he's an excellent case study of how people can achieve something great in very pressing and trying times. Thank you so much for watching, this is Wyvo Joe. If you've got this far, then I assume this content is your cup of tea, so please don't forget to hit subscribe and ring the bell on your way to watch whatever you're gonna watch, man. I can't. I can't make you not watch it. I can't make you watch it. But I'll tell you what I'd recommend, right? There's this really cool guy called Wyvo Joe and he's made other videos. Like nine other videos. You should watch all of them. Give them more likes. And share them. Share them with your friends. Let them know that you're invested in their education. <laughs>